From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to this week's Middle East Focus. Uh, the challenges of U.S. policy toward Iran go all the way back to 1979 when the Islamic Revolution there turned a longtime ally to an implacable adversary. The relationship got off to a terrible start with the long captivity of U.S. embassy personnel in Tehran and a U.S. tilt towards Iraq in the devastating Iran-Iraq War of 1980-89. The two powers also clashed in Lebanon. This week marked the 34th anniversary of the U.S. Marine barracks bombing in Beirut that the U.S. blamed on Iran. President Bill Clinton pursued a containment strategy toward Iran, and George W. Bush named it a member of the Axis of Evil. President Obama took a different tack, engaging in multilateral negotiations that led to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, in 2015, that hoped to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions. President Trump came to office promising to tear up the nuclear deal and stand up to Iran. With me to discuss the options for U.S. strategy toward Iran are Ken Pollock, a resident scholar currently at the American Enterprise Institute and formerly the director of the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Paul. And uh, my friend Bilal Saab, a senior fellow here at MEI and director of our defense and security program. Good morning, Bilal. Thanks, Paul, for having me. Ken and Bilal, you just came out with a detailed report called U.S. Strategy Options for Iran's Regional Challenge, published by the Atlantic Council, and an essay version of that called Countering Iran in the Washington Quarterly. Let me start with the second half of the title and maybe ask you, Ken, how do you define Iran's regional challenge? Well, I think we have to start by saying that whatever we may want from Iran, the Iranians have consistently opposed American interests in the region. They've done it directly by saying they want to drive the United States out of the region and even attacking the U.S. personnel, U.S. interests throughout the region, but also indirectly by going after our many allies. And again, whether we want this or not, it is a reality. And it's something that I think both Bilal and I felt had stepped up over the last two or three years, and therefore one that was part of the problem of the Middle East. But last point on that, we need to recognize that part of the Iranian challenge is taking advantage of the many other problems of the Middle East. Iran is not the cause of all the instability in the region, but it certainly does try to take advantage of it. And if the United States is going to develop a comprehensive approach toward the region that tries to deal with it in all of its different dimensions, part of it has to be on minimizing Iran's ability to exacerbate those many problems. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. Bilal, before getting into the policy options for the U.S. That, that you've outlined in the two versions of the paper, what is it do you think that Iran wants? What is it trying to get to? I mean, Ken indicated that they're certainly opposing U.S. interests uh, in, in, you know, in the Middle East and so on. What is it they're trying to get for themselves? Let me just emphasize one point that Ken made also, which I think really bears emphasizing over and over again, is that this desire of them to expand their influence has been made so much easier, frankly, by the many mistakes that we've made. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we've done in Iraq, obviously, since the invasion, and then what we haven't done in Syria, I mean, they've seized those opportunities very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the first order of business is to actually stop screwing up, mm -hmm. right? and then really come up with policy options to counter whatever activities that they're pursuing. So that's always really worth emphasizing. Mm -hmm. Back to your question. What is it that they really want? I have no clue. Except that, I mean, this is a country that sees itself as playing a really important civilizational role in the region. They've had a very proud history. They're a large, very proud country. And they have a lot of interest in the region. And they certainly see a lot of threats. And I think the minimalist interpretation of that is that they just seek survival mm -hmm. as the regime sees it, right? And that could be interpreted in many ways. Uh, a more ambitious, generous interpretation of that is that they simply want to pursue a cause that they believe in, which seems to be a little bit genuine to me, frankly, which has to do with the Islamic Revolution and mm -hmm. the Wilayat al -Faqih. And their whole vision of you know, how the region and perhaps think, the world I think there's some be. truth to that. It's not all disingenuous. Okay, who of you wants to 
explicate the five options you considered before uh, they're pointing at each other. So I will pick well, one. Well, I mean, I, 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 do, I, I do like the structure that we follow, which is escalatory, basically starting from really minimalist to what we've done since, as you described in your uh, introductory remarks, since the days of Bill Clinton, since the very formation of the Islamic mm -hmm. Republic. All the way to now what the Trump administration seems to be interested in doing, which is pursuing actually elements of pushback, which is the strategy that we are recommending. So the first two that you, you mentioned are minimal containment and enhanced containment. Before getting on to what you end up recommending, which is pushback, how would you define can the minimal containment and the enhanced containment, and have we tried those before? Yeah, we certainly have. First, as we point out in both the article and the report, Minimal containment has been the minimal element of every American policy toward Iran since so the that's Islamic been Revolution. Through every exactly. all the right. it, is, it is the consistent thread running through everything. Which that is we do. what is that? Sanctions or a combination it's, of? It's it, certainly it has elements of sanctions, right? About weakening Iran and limiting its ability to cause problems in the Middle East. But at its heart, it comes down to things like simple deterrence. Right? Making sure that the Iranians are not in a position to even think about attacking any of their neighbors, certainly not Got attacking it. any sort of, of our in a friends. more conventional sense. Exactly. And what's enhanced containment then? Well, enhanced containment, as we were conceiving of it, was about really helping our allies and partners in the region to develop their own capabilities to do so, both to defend themselves and therefore limit Iran's ability to make trouble, but also potentially to bring pressure upon Iran from those countries themselves. So it wasn't always us going directly at the Iranians. And it didn't always have to be a Washington-Tehran fight, that some of our allies would have the capabilities to do some things on their own so that Tehran didn't always have to conceive of it as coming at us. Mm -hmm. And they also had to take into consideration the interests and the concerns of our allies themselves, which, let's, let's face facts, differ from ours in sure. important ways. Yeah. Well, the third option you laid out in the paper was called sandbagging. Obviously, there's a lot of sand in the region. Yeah. What is sandbagging and how is it different than containment? One imagines sandbags containing a flood or containing something. It reminds me of days of civil war in Beirut with mm -hmm. sandbags and a lot of... All uh, over the place. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, I mean, the bottom line is that this is a war of attrition at the end of the day, uh, really to prevent the Iranians from um, gaining outright victories, right? Whether it's in Iraq or Syria or in any other place. It's a long-term process. And as I said before, you know, you move from one option to the other. It's more escalatory, basically, from enhanced containment, where we also apply a set of other sanctions and more creative ways to make it more costly for the Iranians to really uh, succeed and achieve all their interests and ambitions in the region. But it stops there. Right. And so this is where from there we move to pushback. what you call pushback. That's right. What are the is pushback rollback effectively? Because if you look at containment and sandbagging and all of that, none of that has worked in the sense that today Iran is in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq and in a little bit in Yemen or in some way in Yemen. So the flood has happened as a way. Now it's a question of pushing back. And your option is called pushback. Does that mean rollback? And if so, how do you define it or how is it done? Sure. We specifically stayed away from the term rollback because it obviously has Cold War connotations. I'm sorry for bringing it no, back It's okay. In. It's a perfectly reasonable <laughs> question, Paul. But yeah. yeah, I think the way you've described it nicely. So the first two options are really pretty defensive options. One is real minimal defensive. The other is a little bit more enhanced. Sandbagging is a more offensive option, but exactly the way that Bilal described it, it's a long-term strategy, it's attritional, it's about bogging Iran down, right? But it is about coming after them and making them start to spend resources and pay a price in some of these places where they've been able to expand their uh, influence. So you're defining sort of the sandbagging option I mean, it's you know a bit, a bit like sand bogging, and this is bog yeah. them down. Exactly. Somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. That's what them... the term sand yes, interesting. Sand yeah. means. Pushback, we would argue, is taking sandbagging to the next level of trying to create a much more decisive set of offensive campaigns against the Iranians, not necessarily against the regime itself. Right. That's the last option that we held out, which is the ultimate offensive one of taking the fight to the regime itself, trying to destabilize it and take it down. Pushback lay in between. It's about going after the Iranians in the region but doing it with more resources and a greater willingness to bring about decisive results much faster than sandbagging, but again, not necessarily going after the Iranians so sort of, at home. In a way, taking them on. Let me ask right. Bilal, I mean, uh, 
the components that we generally see, one is working with allies and giving them more capacities and so on in the region. There is U.S. direct kinetic action, as mm. they say, which is currently being used effectively, I would say, against ISIS, mm -hmm. but not currently turned against Iranian-backed militias mm -hmm. so far and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, those seem so far to have been the two tools, yes. building up allies, but generally that's been conventional forces and anti-missile systems and air, you know, air sure. force things and naval. Sure. And then the U.S. goes and does expeditionary stuff in Iraq or Syria or somewhere else. Whereas Iran has been very good at building up proxy expeditionary force militias mm -hmm. that are now maybe 150,000 mm -hmm. seasoned troops that are not Iranian, but are Iranian trained and led in some cases. And there doesn't seem to be a counterpart to that. Right. Let me just emphasize one thing also that I'm pretty sure uh, Ken would agree with, and we did mention it in the report, which is that the most indispensable element of pushback really is not kinetic. As much as I agree with you that, you know, developing the military capabilities of partners, which we've been talking about since 9-11, especially since the Iraq war, you know, an effort that has been met with some success, although there have been a lot of failures, obviously, in Kirkuk, what happened in Kirkuk just recently is just one example of an embarrassing failure, frankly, of equipment ending up in the hands of Iranian militias. But the most important element is the issue of reform. I mean, there's no way we can do this without the partners committing to the most potent antidote to Iranian interference, which is their own societies not rebelling against them and being content participating in the politics of the country and ah, so obviously being reform integrated. in our partners? I mean, political oh, reform within the partners. Absolutely. I thought you were going I mean, like we, military we, reform or I mean, we could end approach. up with the most competent yeah. militaries in the region, but, but there is, there's something much more fundamentally broken in these societies that makes it so much easier for the Iranians to meddle. Exactly. I mean, as we point out in the report, you know, the Iranians are not 10 feet tall. Right. We have a bad habit of ascribing every problem in the Middle East to some Iranian plot. And the truth of the matter is that mostly where the Iranians make their gains is they go looking for the internal fissures in these societies. They go looking for the problems that Bilal was, was talking about, and then they try to make them worse. They pry them apart. And you want to shut that down? You want to stop Iran in the region? The best way is to start helping the people of the region fix those problems. Well, if this strategy were adopted and were to play out. I mean, the four main arenas, I suppose, we mentioned Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon. Let's start with Iraq. There are U.S. forces there, U.S. allies there. There are Iranian-backed militias. There's Iranian commanders in and out. And things are moving very quickly, as you just indicated, the events in Kirkuk, the Kurdish referendum. Yes, victory against ISIS in Mosul. Ken, let me ask you, what would this mean in Iraq? pushing back on, Ir on Iran in Iraq. Yeah, Take an a, example. This is a great issue, and it's a perfect segue from your last question, Paul, because the fact of the matter is Iran has tremendous influence in Iraq. Uh, structurally, it has lots of advantages and likely to, to maintain that interest for some time. But what we've seen, in particular back in 2008 and 2009, is that when Iraqis are feeling united, when Iraqis are feeling good about their future and good about their leadership, they push the Iranians out. Mm -hmm. They push the Iranians out completely in 2008 to the point where the Iranians had virtually no influence in Iraq between 2008 and 2010. And unfortunately, in 2010, the, the United States opened the door and let Iran right back in. But you know, Bilal's point about Kirkuk is an important one. Once again, we saw the Iranians able to take action in Iraq against another Iraqi group. Now, you can agree, disagree with the Kurdish referendum. You can say it was the dumbest thing in the world. But what Iraqis saw was Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps organizing an offensive against the Kurds. They moved with great uh, alacrity and great decisiveness, and the U.S. did nothing. That is not going to help mend the fissures in Iraqi society, and that is not going to help Iraqis feel like they are strong enough to resist Iran. So you're saying, I mean, the best way to reduce Iranian influence, and I agree, the best way to reduce Iranian influence in Iraq is to strengthen Iraqi institutions, exactly. the Iraqi state, and help them fix... What is national but, reconciliation, to make them feel unified. I fully agree. Does that mean that the pushback strategy is effect in Iraq is not really kind of a military or kinetic strategy. It is help Iraqis, you know, push back by 
fixing things and helping things. Absolutely. Is that- Yeah, there, just, there is a security yeah. component because I think maintaining troops in Iraq is going to be very important in the future. But again, largely from the perspective of making all Iraqis feel like they're not going to have force used against them. Right, making them feel comfortable and begin to trust each other so that they can engage in that political give and take, which is going to be critical to rebuilding their society. So we can call it, build it and they will go. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Bilal, Syria. Uh, I mean, Syria is the biggest arena. Iraq uh, is is smaller in the sense of you know Iranian influence. Iraq has its you know pretty legitimate government, has elections, has a constitution, all of that. Syria is really the game changer where Iran has stepped in big time and uh, with Russian support. What does pushback mean in in Syria? I wish I disagreed with you that it's not a game changer. It is, but the problem is that if Iraq was difficult, Syria is infinitely more. And for a lot of the reasons that I mentioned before, which is the fact that we have done so little deliberately mm -hmm. in Syria to reverse the gains that the Iranians have made. But we do start with a major handicap. The Iranian interest in Syria is far more important than ours in Syria, frankly. And we have to start, this is where we started the report, we have to start with U.S. interests. If the U.S. interest is ill-defined or not as strong, then that in itself will explain the level of commitment that we will have. Syria is not as important for us, beyond the counterterrorism mission, for obvious reasons. To reverse the Iranian gains now, after all this time, is going to require much, much more than four years ago when we started doing training programs with the rebels and we had the right ideas, except the execution sucked so badly. Does that mean cut your losses? Maybe, but I would focus more on red lines. Frankly, what really, really, really matters to us in Syria as far as Israeli security, as far as uh, weapons of mass destruction just being transferred from one place to another, those are the things that we need to work with the Russians with. Obviously, it's not just the Iranians who are in Syria who are important, but also the Russians. Mm -hmm. But I think the balance of interests, the fact that the Iranians have much more at stake in Syria than we do, will make it much harder for us to really drastically change the situation in Syria. I'm going to jump in here. This is an issue which has moved a lot since since Bilal and I wrote, and I don't know if we still agree on this, but I'd go a step farther than Bilal. I think he's absolutely right about Iran having much greater interests in Syria than we do. I see that as a vulnerability. And I think that one of the things that we were talking about in pushback- An Iranian vulnerability. An Iranian vulnerability, exactly. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that we talked about in pushback was the need to demonstrate to our allies a willingness to take on Iran, to push back on them, to make them feel more comfortable under those circumstances. To my mind, the place to do that is in Syria. Now, Bilal is absolutely right. It has gotten so much harder since we first put pen to paper. But nevertheless, I think that it's an enormous mistake to simply give up. I think that there's still huge numbers of Syrians that don't want to be ruled by the Assad regime. I think that the U.S. has a tremendous opportunity to hurt Iran and hurt Iranian interests in Syria. And I will say from my own part, I find it incredibly difficult to reconcile the Trump administration's rhetorical commitment to something similar to what we've laid out, a strategy of pushback, right. and give up on Syria. Right. right. I, I think the idea of pushing back on Iran in Yemen is a terrible idea because we don't have any interests there. And the truth is, we should really be helping our allies get out of Yemen. As we talked about Iraq, I think there's a way to do it, but it is a fragile society. I think that going kinetic there would break Iraq. To me, Syria is the place where you want to push back on Iran, where you are able to hurt them in a way that they are going to find it very painful and very hard to push back on us because their interests are so much more engaged than ours. Yeah, I guess the me, failures mm -hmm. of the training programs were not inevitable. I mean, the fact that we ended up with, what, five people after 50. burning through $500 million, and we had in mind a 5,000-man force, I mean, that was embarrassing, but it wasn't inevitable. I mean, at the end of the day, in all foreign policy and pushbacks and strategies, the objective is to impact the other side's behavior, the other side's mm -hmm. policy. Uh, in the JCPOA negotiation, uh, President Obama first started with an international coalition and sanctions, a lot of pressure, and, and then Iran came to the table. They negotiated a certain change of behavior. You know, people have, you know, comments on that. That's fine. In all of these considerations of strategy, they, you know, the end point we want to get to is changing their behavior. And often that, well, my question is, does any of this have a diplomatic component? Like while putting pressure, 
uh, because this administration doesn't seem to talk or want to talk or negotiate anything. They just sort of want to push back. And in a way, the Trump administration, as you've sort of hinted, are, have sort of adopted a pushback kind of strategy. You have comments about its impl implementation here or there, but it sounds pretty close to their to their mood, let's put it that way. But should there be a political or diplomatic component to this? And if so, what would it look like? Well, you're absolutely right. It seems to be close to their mood, but we're not seeing their they're execution. Very, they're very moody. Right. You know, their execution is not <laughs> at all what we would Fine. think of. Yes. And obviously there needs to be a diplomatic component, first of all, to the region. That's critical to Europe, to our other allies. It's got to be a collective effort. <laughs> I would go so far as to say that I think that there ought to be a diplomatic outreach to Iran. Um, I am a big believer in talking to the Iranians. I'm actually a big believer in the potential for rapprochement with Iran. I was part of the Clinton NSC. I was in favor of his outreach to Iran then. The Bill I believe Clinton in, or Hillary Clinton? Uh, the Bill Clinton administration, <laughs> yes. NSC. Um, and I'm also, I, I also supported President Obama's efforts. But the problem that we have right now is that Obama's efforts did fail. Right, and we need to recognize that. And rather than wanting a rapprochement with us, they seems, failed on the regional side of things. Well, they failed because least, the Iranians yeah. weren't interested. The Iranians conceived of the JCPOA as being compartmented, a one-off. We're going to trade you sanctions for our nuclear program. That's it. Right, there was no effort to come to a wider meeting of the minds on regional issues, which is what the Obama people hoped for. So I'm all in favor of doing it, but I think that we need to recognize right now, and this was part of the impetus for Bilal and I to write this and argue for pushback, which is simply that this is where the Iranians are. Now, if we implement pushback, and if it succeeds, and the Iranians come around and they say, you know what, you're right, maybe we shouldn't just try to fight you all across the Middle East. We would be glad to have some conversations. My feeling is that's what victory looks like. Bilal, any last words of No, that was very well said, comprehensive. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if we're going to adopt some other elements of the options that we mentioned, I mean, there's got to be some kind of talking with the Iranians especially the sandbagging option and maybe in um, in the Gulf where we might loosen the rules of engagement, right? I mean, it's not just all kinetic, aggressive. There's got to be an element of talking to them. And they're obviously amenable to that when, especially as you mentioned, with the case of the Iranian uh, nuclear issue. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Bilal. And uh, well, for this discussion and for our audience for tuning in, you can get access to, I think, the Atlantic Council report on their website. It's also, I think, on our MEI website as well. Uh, so uh, I urge our listeners to go uh, take a look at it there. If you'd like to join the conversation about today's podcast, just go to our Facebook uh, page. That's facebook.com forward slash Middle East Institute. Thank you, Bilal, and thank you, Ken, for joining me today. And to our audience, uh, see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.